Ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon to you all. My name is Stephen Cole, and I'm very honoured and pleased to be the moderator for today's webinar, LNG Now a Global Fuel in Response to Volatile Markets, hosted by the Alatea Foundation in partnership with Refinitiv and LSEG Business. Now, uh, just a few housekeeping rules for the discussion for the best viewing experience. Please read the instructions. Uh, on the media or above the media player. For any technical issues during the webinar, please refresh the page or reach out via uh, issue services at lseg.com. Any questions you have for the speaker, you can click on ask a question. This is important because we need to hear from you. Please note in the interest of time, we may be unable to address all the questions. Uh, and during this session, uh, you'll be taking part in polling questions and the recording of the session will be available using the same event link. So those are the instructions, but I think probably sort of, let's have a little context for today. LNG is advancing toward becoming a global commodity following the expansion of markets, growing volumes and liquidity, and increase in spot market transactions. As buyers push for destination flexible contracting and trading, that allows them to resell or swap LNG cargoes, and vessels are gaining more freedom to trade and market players are better optimizing their positions. These trends have brought new players to the LNG industry, which traditionally comprised just uh, a small group of uh, participants. The vast fleet of LNG carriers, there were at the last estimate about 740, 739 uh, at the end of 2022, is contributing to the phenomenal growth in global LNG trade flows. Uh, last year, the value of global LNG trade doubled to an all-time high of 450 billion US dollars, rising by five and a half percent in volumetric terms, according to the IEA. Such growth in global trade volumes is making it easier for producers to propagate LNG as a global commodity while helping elevate LNG status as a clean, a flexible, uh, and a cost-efficient fuel. Meanwhile, the quadrupling of European natural gas prices over the summer months last year, coupled with a much smaller increase in US gas prices, created a, um, shall we say, compelling arbitrage opportunity. LNG shippers realized enormous profits by buying natural gas in the US, liquidizing it, and shipping it to uh, Europe and Asia. With destination clauses gradually being eliminated, more arbitrage opportunities could emerge. That said, several factors have made it difficult to continue capitalizing on high LNG prices in Europe, uh, including the decreased demand due to that milder than usual winter and excess LNG import capacity and the EU's new price cap on imported gas. These factors have resulted in downward pressure on future prices. Tumbling natural gas prices are now driving more coal to gas switching across Europe, where gas power plants have become cheaper to run than coal. Furthermore, by the end of uh, this year, uh, EU countries are expected to have added an estimated 40 BCM of LNG import capacity, again, according to the IEA. Like Europe, Asia's mild weather and weak demand for natural gas have led to a decline in spot LNG prices earlier this year, which is has uh, incentivized a, a South Asian economies to return to the spot market. While Europe has traditionally been a residual market for LNG, South Asia appears to be taking this position, acquiring the less price sensitive cargo, while the role of balancing destination is also shifting from Europe to China. Additionally, and lastly, Southeast Asia's economic growth and ability to meet its climate commitments relies heavily on the region's access to affordable natural gas. So that is the context for today's webinar. Um, so who's going to talk about it? Well, let me introduce the speakers for this session. Uh, David Ledesma is a distinguished research fellow, the Oxford Institute for Energy Studies. Patrick Hebriard is managing director, FTI Consulting based in Paris, and Graham, Graham Wild Goose, a manager, Potens LNG and natural gas. Before we talk to them, uh, this panel, um, we're going to start with our first poll question uh, to set the scene, which you should be able to see on your screen now. And there's the question, um, which of the following changes would contribute the most 
to globalizing the natural gas market. A, the ability to transport natural gas uh, to markets at a reasonable cost. B, the rise of LNG portfolio players, which could provide greater flexibility and resilience to the market. C, the growing use of floating storage and regasification units, FSRUs, to enable more countries to import natural gas. Or D, more LNG tankers and import terminals to expand the global reach of natural gas. So those are the alternatives. Which are the following changes? So let's find out what the answers will be in a moment. Just to remind you in this webinar, we'll be discussing the changing dynamics influencing global LNG markets, the latest shifts in supply and demand and price trends. And we will hopefully see uh, the results on your screen uh, in a moment. While we wait for the viewers to come in, um, there's the poll question. Just a reminder, A, B, C or D, A, the ability to transport natural gas, the rise of LNG portfolio players uh, for flexibility and resilience to the market and the growing use of floating storage and regasification units to enable more countries to import natural gas. And lastly, D, more LNG tankers and import terminals to expand the global reach of natural gas. And the question or the answers hopefully should be coming in very soon and then what i'll do i suspect uh, before we go to the ah hold on i think the results have come in um right okay i think this is overwhelming um yeah uh can you see the results uh gentlemen no no we can't see okay um well i can tell you that uh we are we, it's a split at the moment between a and b about half the audience say the the ability to transport natural gas to markets at a reasonable cost and 50 percent also say the rise of lng portfolio players which could provide greater flexibility and resilience to the market so a split a, a, a draw between a and b um C and D, again, roughly the same, strange enough, both 33%. Uh, so, interesting um, about a division there. Not a lot of um, space between A, B, C and D. Well, none between A and B and a very little between C and D. David, your reaction to that? Yeah, I think my reaction, Stephen, I, I asked myself looking at this, which one I would have voted for, and I would have voted for B because... You know, we've got to have flexible LNG. As you said earlier on, the business is changing from kind of a, a more traditional structure to a traded structure. And, you know, 50 percent of world LNG now is, is flexible in nature and actually 80 percent uh, of all the Atlantic Basin LNG and all volumes, of course, from the U.S. Uh, are, are flexible. So I think B, it's, it's that ability of the portfolio players to act as the bridge between the long term uh, contracts to underpin new regas capa liquefaction capacity and the buyers and the market to maybe want short-term contracts so uh, yeah I'd, I'd, I'd lump for B. Okay uh, Patrick? Yeah actually I was going for for well A and B I mean I was uh, my mind was not really made up on, on one or the other but I fully agree with uh, with what David uh, just explained on, on, on B and to me I think well A would certainly contribute in the sense that uh, well, if you can move the LNG with at reasonable cost and not having much of a difference in cost between while well, moving LNG to one market or the other, then it would facilitate as well the, the trading of such uh, such LNG and the commoditization of, uh, of it. So uh, to me, yeah, NB would be the natural one. Uh, and I mean, all of this and CND would contribute as well. But to me, uh, certainly NB would, uh, would be the most important one. Uh, and Graham, that makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Yeah, I just think we need to be a little bit careful of the terminology on this question, because really, in, in truth, in no sense do we have a globalised natural gas market, natural gas markets, and indeed in your introduction, Stephen, you introduced the, the arbitrage between Henry Hub and 
you know, European or Asian uh, LNG prices. So, you know, those prices are really in no sense connected. What we do have, which I think we're going to go on to talk about more in this, uh, this session, is an increasingly globalized LNG market, which is quite different from the global gas market. And uh, on that point, I would agree that, in my view, B has probably played the major part in, in incre increasing the, the globalization of LNG and, and the, if you like, commoditization of the LNG business. Interesting. Thank you, Graham. That, that's good to make that difference between LNG and gas as well. Um, let, let's let's um, start talking now about the other issues, uh, moving away from the uh, poll answers. Uh, David, what does... Uh, 2023 have in store, do you think, when it comes to LNG supply and demand? What what are the top trends to watch for this year and, and beyond? Right. Well, it, it, specifically on 2023, uh, the supply side uh, depends on kind of the reliability from uh, existing projects and indeed the startup of new volumes from projects under construction. And on the demand side, you know, where... As Graham said, you know, we, we have this global market, which I must say uh, over the past few years of you know, pretty much turmoil in the market has worked, actually. Uh, uh, but the factors that drive gas and energy demand do vary by countries and regions. And you mentioned some of those, Steve, in your introduction. But, you know, Europe, you know, let's be clear, weather is always the key variable in addition to the pace of move to renewables. Uh, but we must also not underestimate the loss of gas demand that we're seeing through higher energy prices. All of us you know, on this call are experiencing that. The other key variable that is you know, really going to look out for in 2023 is China, you know, a country uh, that it's certainly a key uncertainty when it comes to planning LNG supply demand with energy demand linked to economic activity. But which energy is used is very much a uh, policy driven. And, you know, as I think it's fair to say with many other countries, security of energy supply uh, is often in priority to environmental considerations. Now, you mentioned South Asia, India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, very much a price uh, sensitive area with prices that current levels are OK, but they've got to be below eight dollars per mm BTU to be attracted. Southeast Asia is just boomtown uh, recovery uh, with economic growth. But let's not forget uh, South America, uh, where, you know, it's very much weather driven. If you've got hydro uh, rainfall, then uh, energy is not demanded. If you don't have rainfall, energy and hydroelectric power is not uh, in production. Then suddenly it can pull LNG. And indeed, it has in the past. It's outbid for LNG for uh, coming from uh, Europe. So over the next couple of years, 2023, 2024, you know, it's going to be tight. Uh, with new LNG supply that's currently under construction starting up 2025. But post-2025, uh, I see some weakness coming in. I would just like to raise one more point, Stephen, if I can, uh, following what you said about more players coming into the business. You know, we've seen very volatile prices over the past few years, which has actually created a lot of challenges to traders, some who did not make the, the large returns which you referred to in your introductory remarks because of the hedging activity. So I think, you know, to play in this market, you've got to have big balance sheets, uh, and that actually might reduce the, the, the number of players who are able to trade LNG, but also we need contractual structures that are going to support that. So I hope that's kind of given some sort of insight as to where I see the kind of next 12 to 18 months going. Uh, just, but I want to go to Graham next, but just to stay with you for a second, David. Yeah. What, what, what turmoil do you mean, and what caused it, and is a turmoil over? Uh, turmoil, and I think I'm referring to turmoil in volatility of prices. Uh, when you have prices to, today that are 10% of where they were in August last year, managing any portfolio, in any commodity, uh, would be very challenging. And, you know, it means that you have players who've got to have balance sheets to be able to support their hedging activity as well as their physical trading activity. OK, lovely. Uh, Graham? And, um, and sorry, just on that, but but still prices probably five plus times uh, where they were uh, three years ago. So, yeah, yeah really right. yeah, uh, yeah. incredible volatility over the past yeah. two or three years. Yeah, um, I agree. Thanks for that. Uh, what are the latest developments in LNG contracting and, and business models? Will long term contracts re reclaim territory from the spot market, do you think? Well, long term contracts have uh, 
never gone away in uh, any sense. I think we can uh, get a little bit carried away about some of these conversations uh, sometime. If you look at, I think, uh, more or less every new liquefaction project in the world is underpinned by uh, long-term offtake contracts. Now, the difference that we've seen over time is that, you know, end users or ultimate buyers of LNG have tended to fall out of the picture of, of signing up for those long-term contracts from supply projects. To some extent, that position has been taken over by what we'd call LNG aggregators, portfolio players, or, or traders. But those long-term contracts are still there. And, and you know, all your US projects, which have, uh, you know, they're the ones that have been go taking positive uh, final investment decisions this year and the last year in the response to the, the, the war in Ukraine. All of those contracts have basically been 20-year 20 um, year contracts. So, yes, they're then reselling those some of those volumes on different bases, some of them short term, I agree. And, you know, the latest uh, data, I think, for for 2021 from GII GNL had spot and short term, you know, over 35 percent of the global market. But, you know, you still have a market that, that fundamentally is is dominated by long term contracts. Yeah, indeed. Um, uh, Patrick, how how will the commoditization of LNG path play out in the coming years? And this is I know I'm asking you all to look forward and uh, speculate, but I think it's, it's important. Uh, how will that LNG path play out in the coming years and what considerations do traders need to keep in mind? Well, I think that's what well, it was rightly said. So this is really about the LNG being commoditized uh, and becoming, well, it's a global market, so it's on its way to become uh, more commoditized. But it, it's very different from what we see from the oil market, for instance. Well, the product is different, it cannot be stored in the same way. Uh, LNG, well, you cannot just keep it in the tank as long as you want. And uh, because uh, it changes, you have the boil off, you're losing uh, gas. So it's, it's different. Uh, and you still need these long-term contracts, whereas uh, the oil market is basically uh, well, extremely well commoditized. You, you don't need to have this, this long-term contract because if you have a development, then there is the, uh, well, let's say the assumption that the market would be able to absorb uh, the new production, whereas for gas, it's not the case. You need to have these long-term contracts to underpin the investment. Uh, and and that, that's key. This is exactly what Graham explained, that this is why there is still this long-term contract uh, here uh, on the market. Uh, there was this fantasy that at some point in time in Europe, when the market became liberalized, that uh, there could be uh, no longer any long-term contract, that it could be purely commoditized, that gas would flow from anywhere to anywhere in Europe. This is not yet the case. So uh, yes, it's uh, it's becoming more and more uh, traded. The, the the emergence of these portfolio players, the the emergence of pure traders uh, for LNG is also a key factor that will contribute to to bring flexibility to the market uh, and will uh, well move uh, the market towards more uh, commoditization. And I think it's just a natural way uh, things will evolve. But uh, it's taking long time between uh, the uh, well, what we was perceived as uh, okay this is going to be a very commoditized market uh, as of now because uh, the market is liberalized and that will help removing destination clothes destination clothes and so on uh, but we're still far from that and it will take a long time before uh, it's going to be commoditized uh lng maybe but uh, before we will reach a global gas market i don't think it's, it's going to to happen anytime soon uh, as i said we have different and David, different dynamics regionally speaking there is a connection between this market with the lng but the gas markets are inherently different from one region to the other yeah yeah, if course. I could just jump in, if I could jump in with a comment, I agree completely with what Patrick said. I do believe that the the pace of commoditization has slowed down following the COVID and also the current uh, war uh, with Russia and Ukraine. We were heading on on a path towards uh, greater traded volumes, but now, as I said in in, in my, my my comments, security of supply very much is driving the agenda of of most countries. So I think there is a slowdown of that commoditization. 
uh, and the, the long-term contract's a bit of a misnomer because with middlemen uh, uh, sitting as, as traders in the middle, you know, one hand takes the, the long-term contract and sells it on uh, with a higher margin uh, on shorter-term contracts to buyers who don't want necessarily long-term contracts, and they're happier to they're happy to pay a premium uh, for that middleman to take uh, that uh, commodity risk, as long as they get the LNG. Um, as long as they get the energy, absolutely, in, in, on, on the basis they want, when they want it, uh, and under the contracts they want, yes. But, yeah, exactly. but then, but then, David, you know that that even on the buy side, we're still seeing you know strong prevalence of say five to ten year purchase contracts, which you know by most standards would count as a long term contract. Okay, it's not it's not twenty years. Yeah. What we're not seeing is uh, you know. Uh, intermediaries buying on 20 year contracts and then selling all those volumes uh, spot or short term no. I, I agree with the point that you made that you know if you look at um jkm for example if we went if we go back to 2021 we we saw what you know looked like a perennially upward moving slope yeah. of of trading volumes but what you've seen from 2021 to 2022 is a, is a huge drop on uh, trading volumes on on mm. JKM. Now, some of that for sure is driven by what you described of, mm. you know, what we saw very, very high prices leading to sort of unprecedented collateral requirements for, for trading, forcing a lot of people um, out of the market. But, you know, I agree that it's certainly not a not a one way street and a move towards a full full commoditization of this market by by any stretch of the imagination. Um, David, with destination clauses progressively being eliminated uh, from long term LNG supply contracts, couldn't we expect to see more international arbitrage opportunities? Do you think? I I. I, uh, I... I think that we're seeing the international arbitrage anyway at the moment because the marginal volume uh, of people's portfolio is sufficient to be able to support that. Obviously, the more, more flexible contracts we have uh, means that people have the choice. But in, you've got to understand traditionally, you know, you were buying your LNG X ship uh, or you were buying it with solid de destination restrictions. Therefore, you had no flexibility. Now, uh, with a lot of FOB purchases where you, where you actually buy, you use your own vessel and flexibility in contracts. Uh, you're able to uh, you're able to have that flexibility. Some suppliers still insist on uh, destination restrictions or controlling the shipping, uh, so that they're able to control where the destination is. So I think, yeah, you know, there's no doubt about it. There is a relationship between destination flexibility and the ability to trade more volume. Uh, Patrick, um, now that South Asian economies are returning to the spot LNG market, how long do you see that trend lasting for? Well, it's, I mean, we, we've just seen that uh, actually when well, sports market has been, well, or sports uh, trading has been uh, well, slightly reducing uh, over the past year. So uh, I think that it's extremely difficult to say if it's going to be uh, uh, actually a long term trend in this sports market, uh, the uh, energy market for South, uh, Southeast Asian uh, economy. But uh, to me, there would still be very much focus on the security of supply and even more so now after, well, after while uh, the war is, is still ongoing. And, and this will be, uh, this will have long lasting effects on, on the need to secure uh, supply for gas and LNG. So I think that, of course, there will still be a spot energy market because uh, it provides the flexibility uh, to adjust the supply and demand. But the, to me, the, the main, uh, the basis will still remain long term. Uh, the, uh, I think it would be a bit, uh, honestly, foolish to rely purely on the spot energy market for what well, for any economy, for any buyer. Uh, if you have a demand and if you have a certainty on a, let's say, a given percentage of your demand, you need to cover it with long term to guarantee and have the security of supply. Uh, and, I, I, and just to comment on what David said earlier on the destination clause, I think uh, it's exactly the key. The decision goes into one one thing, but the the main uh, well, the thing that had the main impact on the market and the the, the ability to trade is the sell on FOB basis. The, the the fact that all or most uh, of the U.S. LNG, which is now the the main LNG exporter, are on an FOB basis and can go to Europe or Asia. I mean, it's creating this uh, this uh, platform for uh, well, 
more active trading and uh, commoditization. So this is to me the, what has changed significantly over the past few years uh, on the market. All right, Patrick. Well, I, I think it's time to sort of um, uh, have a look at a second poll for this webinar um, and uh, pose the question, what, uh, and ask you to look in your uh, looking glass uh, for, what will be the strongest driver of LNG demand in Asian markets over the next 10 years? What will be the strongest driver of LNG uh, demand in Asian markets over the next decade? The choices, continuous population growth, further electrification, the curtailment of new and existing coal-fired power plants, um, decarbonization targets and climate change commitments. So this is uh, pretty much a, a green question. Uh, there you are. I'll, I'll just repeat them. Uh, the strongest driver, what will be the strongest driver uh, of LNG demand uh, in the uh, Asian markets over the next 10 years? A, continuous population growth, further electrification, um, even though we're told that populations are in fact decreasing. Huge birth rate problems, certainly in Asia. Uh, the curtailment of new and existing coal-fired power plants. We're seeing coal-fired uh, power plants coming back, aren't we? Uh, or decarbonization targets and climate change commitments. They are, those are the questions uh, for you to answer. And I will get the answer or the, your answers uh, very soon, so bear with me. But I'll I'll certainly put those or that uh, second question to the panel as well. Uh, and just so you know, I'll go in reverse order this time to Graham, <laughs> to Graham Patrick, and uh, and David. Uh, but, uh, morning, <laughs> just 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 bear with me for the moment until we find out what um, the results are. Um, it's taking uh, here second poll results coming through. Um, Bear with me, because uh, here we go. Right. Uh, well, sixty percent at the moment. First responses are de decarbonation targets and climate change commitments. Continuous population growth, uh, electrification. Okay, forty percent. Again, it's it's pretty evenly distributed the answers. Mm -hmm. um, let me let me go back because I want to examine these carefully. Uh, continuous population growth is about fifty percent. B is about ah uh, oh, B sorry is is a D so it's A uh, is fifty percent. And then C is 50%. Uh, and the curtailment of new existing power plants, about 33. So opinions equally divided between A and C. Graham, you first. I think to, to echo one of the comments that David made earlier, and I'll give you a good good consultant's answer here, is that it's, it's very <laughs> difficult to generalize between, you know, this blob Asia, very different stories uh, in play between the, the different countries within that region. I think if you look at the mature, if you like, the traditional uh, Asian LNG markets, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, they're very mature. So, you know, I don't think anybody's forecasting any substantial growth in LNG in those markets over the coming years. I think in China, it's really a question of economic growth and following their decarbonization plans. India, obviously another major importer, has got a, a, a defined policy to increase gas in its energy mix, which we would expect to drive demand. And really in in some of the other smaller buyers, it's 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 really a question of uh, power demand growth, and I think a shift away from uh, coal. Okay, let's go, uh, Patrick. Your comments on this? Yeah, I mean, I, I subscribe to to everything that uh, Graham said. I mean, personally, I would have gone uh, with the uh, with C. Uh, could you agree that you have very different market, but 
to me, if, well, if I can try to generalize, yeah, that would be the, the, the main driver, or the, the main, yeah, the main driver, the, the, the factor that would have the main influence uh, on the demand for LNG uh, in, in those markets. Because to me, that uh, encompasses the fact that with decarbonization target, you, that means also further electrification uh, and climate change commitment, you need to uh, actually curtail a coal fire power plant. So, uh, yes, all of this will contribute to, uh, to, to this uh, energy demand, and which would be, uh, well, economically driven, but also very much uh, politically driven for, uh, well, China, for instance. Uh, and, and so we've seen in the past that uh, when China is making a, a decision on its energy policy that has a major impact on the energy market. So uh, if there is a, a really strong decision to curtail or cut off the, uh, the coal power power plant, then uh, that would mean more energy going to China. That would be uh, another game changer on the, on the energy market. Yeah. Um, bef before I go to David, Patrick, just stay with you for a second. Um, how, would you how would you describe uh, demand in China at the moment and the projections for China? Uh, well, I'm not a specialist on the Chinese market, to be honest with you. Uh, but I think, I mean, it, it looks, uh, well, I would say the outlook is uh, positive for energy demand. There is, a, there is still very uh, well, strong demand. We see as well that we've seen that China is also diversifying its, its supply. So not only with energy, but also with pipeline gas. We have this major pipeline uh, project with, uh, with Russia uh, that, is, uh, that, that is ongoing. So it, it's really pushing for generally for gas. So the push for gas is really uh, also benefiting the, well, uh, the LNG. Uh, and LNG uh, well, would be, uh, well, China would be a, a major and would continue to remain the major destination for, uh, for China. I mean, as long as first the economy uh, would keep on, on growing uh, and that uh, there would be uh, this, uh, this policy will to, uh, to, to make things happen on the uh, climate change front, that, uh, to, to make use of more gas than uh, coal. Okay, I'll, I'll come back to China in a moment, but David, your reaction to the poll question? Yeah, just actually, I'll build, just build on China for one sec. You know, when we see there, the primary underpinning of the growth there is not only power generation and residential, but also industrial as well. So it's quite across the band. On, on the poll itself, I actually would have voted for, probably for all three, but it comes down to, <laughs> comes down to which you wouldn't have allowed me to do that, of course. But it is the no, government. No, no, this is a point. democracy. This no, no. Oh, we live in a democracy. <laughs> oh, I mustn't forget that. This, this is the kind of the, the coal, gas and renewable trilemma, isn't it? You know, you've, you've got the coal that gives the security of supply uh, and also relatively low energy costs. You have gas, which is going to is driving the environment, and renewables, which is giving us your your cleanest energy. Uh, and how is this going to move out? And as uh, I, th I think it was Graham, I can't know or Graham or Patrick said, this is being driven by policy. Uh, in the end, if I if I had to lump for one, I would go for C. I have to say, I think getting those decarbonisation targets and climate change commitments actually delivered are key, not only uh, to countries in Asia, but also to our planet. And we mustn't forget also, we've talked about security supply a bit uh, today. If you are able to generate your own renewables, then actually that's giving you security of energy supply as well. So it's again a win-win. Um, let's go back to China, David. I'll, 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 I'll come to you again and, and then Graham. China is increasing its own gas production. Will that significantly affect LNG imports? Uh, I, I, it is increasing its, its production, but... Uh, it, it's economic growth. It's the economic powerhouse. As I said, the uh, the demand growth is across all sectors of demand. Uh, so I think it, it will be able to absorb that, uh, but also LNG imports will still be required. It comes down again. I, I keep mentioning this, Stephen, to security of supply. You know, certainly the 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 implications of the uh, the COVID crisis, together with the kind of the sudden pull uh, of Europe, and it was described earlier on as being a core market rather than a market of last resort, uh, means that you know there's no doubt about it. You know, LNG as a secure supply, a secure, secure energy source uh, for China has re has reduced, uh, and they're going to stay more regional. And I think the the building of relations again with Australia that we've seen very recently is going to give that uh, supply security as well. So I think LNG will have its place. But we haven't talked about pipeline gas. You know, uh, China's been importing pipeline gas from Russia. It's very much in, in, in Russia's interests to have uh, additional volumes being sold into China. And there are plans for additional pipelines to do that. So yeah. uh, LNG okay. will be I mean, I'm wondering if, if, power, if, if power of Siberia, too, is built, 
what effect that would have on Chinese LNG imports? It, 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 well, it depends on it depends on the level of demand growth, doesn't it? It would have an impact, but as Graham said earlier on, uh, a lot of this LNG has been uh, uh, sold in to China and indeed to other Asian countries on long-term contracts. So, uh, in the immediate kind of up until the twenty thirty, will have limited, I would have thought. But after that, you could find some of the long-term yeah. contracts dropping off. If 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 you look at gas in the overall Chinese energy mix, it's very very small. So, mm -hmm. a drive to increase gas penetration which there is, I think, frankly, leaves ample room for supply growth from domestic supply, mm. pipeline imports, LNG imports. So, you know, I, I, as a, an L, if I take the view of an LNG supplier, I don't think we would have any concern that, you know, um, unexpected growth in domestic supply or pipeline imports is, is, is somehow going to, uh, prevent further LNG imports in future. I think there's there's strong scope for for all three, frankly. Okay, thank you, uh, uh, Graham. Um, Patrick, um, European natural gas prices recently dropped uh, to their lowest level since the start of the energy crisis in the middle of 2021. What are the implications, do you think, of those price reductions for LNG trade? Well, first, it's good news for, for gas. So, as you mentioned, I think in your introduction, that means that uh, we we have some coal to gas uh, switch uh, in the power generation. So, that I mean, the, the more affordable gas would be uh, for sure. I mean, it's a it's a no brainer. Uh, the the better it would be in the sense that that would increase or that would increase or that would a lot to keep up uh, the, uh, the the gas demand, uh, and so that could. Because of their uh, well, curtailment of Russian uh, pipeline gas supply to Europe, that would drive uh, LNG growth, and it's expected to do so. I mean, we, we've seen that uh, many uh, European players uh, are moving to or are pro uh, proposing new uh, LNG import terminals. So there is a there is a, well also a need to fill those terminals to to make them economical. So it will also uh, it is expected that it will uh, a lot to to carry the uh, the energy demand growth into Europe. But uh, at the end of the day, it's, uh, I mean, th this expansion and, and the tremendous expected growth of energy into Europe is linked to the uh, Russian pipeline supply, so it's, it's decreased. Now, if we look into the future, and it's clearly not a short, short term option, but the question would remain, and that's a big question, would Russian gas pipeline uh, supply uh, come back to Europe eventually? It would oh, require okay. a major change. That, yes. but eventually, that's also an uncertainty on the future. We were talking about sufficient supply, the the need for long long term contract. So there is the uh, uncertainty over the the role and use of gas in the future in Europe because of uh, well, all this uh, decarbonization and climate change issues. So, but uh, even before that, maybe there is a question: that Can Russian supply uh, come back to Europe? With the change of regime and so on and so forth, but so lots of conditions. But this is creating uncertainty as well. So uh, LNG demand uh, is very much dependent in Europe on, on well, multiple factors, and including this big one, uh, which could come back eventually in a few years time. Let, let's take that a bit further, Patrick. Um, will Europe remain a residual market for LNG after the loss of the Russian pipeline gas, or will South Asia take this position? Well, uh, well, I'm going to take it then. Uh, but uh, obviously, and Hayden Graham, feel free to jump in. So, uh, well, it's uh, it's probably going to be uh, to, to become a primary destination market as long as uh, Russian gas uh, is, is not available uh, or not welcome uh, into Europe, uh, because there is this this uh, tremendous need uh, to to guarantee uh, and well, cover the the demand. So, the security of supply for the demand in Europe. Uh, goes together with a strong energy uh, flow into Europe. So uh, to me, it, it's going to be, uh, I think it's uh, David would say that, it's going to become a core market for LNG rather than a, a, a last resource market. Yeah, Patrick, I, I, I agree with you there. Uh, I do think this question about Russian pipeline gas restarting is, is, is quite key, politically uh, quite a difficult one to discuss. I, ju I just, uh, in the longer term, one hopes that peace will reign uh, in Ukraine and there will be a resolution, there has to be. Uh, and I just can't believe we're going to have such a huge 
gas resource uh, next door to Europe uh, that it will not flow again. So I think there would be uh, a flows again coming into Europe, but there's a big but there. I think there will be uh, policy, dis dis uh, policy uh, made limits to the amount of gas you can take, as indeed we see in Spain already, they have policy limits from their supplies from, from Algeria. I think it also depends on country. Uh, I was in the Baltic countries last week, and I think that the chance of the Baltic countries uh, taking additional uh, Russian gas in the future is very limited. However, if you come to, to France and you come to uh, Germany and to other countries that aren't necessarily directly bordering onto Russia, uh, I think there's likelihood you could take uh, a Russian gas in the future with, with, contractual, with contractual and political limits on import volumes. Very difficult to forecast any of that, David, as, as we all know. Very depending on what happens to uh, in Moscow, perhaps. Um, but um, you said, David, earlier, you would have voted for all three of the polls, <laughs> which is wonderful. Uh, I like that. It's a, it's a good academic answer. Um, oh. But, uh, but what, to what extent are climate change considerations now and net zero commitments contributing to LNG demand, especially in Asia? Because Australia uh, is reducing uh, uh, LNG exports at the moment uh, is what I was hearing yesterday. Yeah, I well, it, look, we must be clear with COP coming up and there'll be COPs every year, the climate is absolutely key. But I do want to come back to security of energy supply. Uh, that it, it, Security of energy supply is number one for the economic growth of countries. But they, we're not just talking about that we're not just talking about an energy, we're talking about coal. The move away from oil has happened. It's the coal to gas uh, and LNG as a form of, of moving gas. So I, I believe that uh, it, the environment is, is, is number one on the agenda. What, I'm, what I was saying earlier on was that I think over the last couple of years, security supply has taken that uh, the, a, a primary focus there. I do, I do think there's, I uh, just want to jump to Europe if I can to, on that question, Stephen, because there's quite an important point here that as people look to secure, uh, Graham mentioned earlier on five to 10 year contract rather than 20 year contracts, that's important for European buyers because if we have a 2030, 2040, 2050 target from a European government to be carbon neutral, uh, the buyers of LNG have to have the ability not only to uh, uh, to cut off their, their energy supply source, but also the infrastructure which has been put into place. They want to, they don't need that infrastructure anymore at all. So uh, the environment is still absolutely key, and I think there's no doubt about it. Politicians and companies are bearing that in mind in making their commercial and political decisions. I think it's, okay. think it's interesting to explore this European security of supply question a yeah. bit further. I mean, <clears throat> if if we and and. This goes back to the point that you made, David, about the market actually working. If we went back to a year ago, there was all this talk about European buyers reverting to long-term contracts, security of supply, et cetera, et cetera. What we've actually seen is that the, the spot uh, gas and LNG market, it worked as it was intended. Yeah. We saw extremely high prices that pooled in unprecedented volumes of LNG that to be honest, when the the EU plan to increase um, LNG into Europe by 50 BCM last year was first brought out, everybody thought that's impossible. It's never going to happen. <laughs> we exceeded that volume uh, comfortably. And, you know, we've got clients of ours who this time last year were looking at long-term contracts again, but they've gone out and procured, successfully procured spot LNG volumes. They've got comfortable with that. And now they're thinking, well, do we really need to bother with uh, with long term contracts? The market seems to be uh, seems to be working as intended. So, I think the 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 huge build out of regas capacity that was was touched on before mm. has played a key role in that. In terms of you know increasing the capability to in import Europe to import the LNG uh, that it needs, mm. but I actually I don't see a huge number of European buyers entering into inflexible uh, long-term, even 10-year uh, yeah. LNG contracts. I just don't see the drivers no, uh, to make that happen. Yeah, I agree with uh, well, I think we've all agreed that it's, 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 sort of, it's a rapidly evolving LNG market. We've got Chinese renewables making significant progress. Australia government perhaps reducing LNG exports. Has Spain got too many LNG terminals now, but little export potential? 
um, what has happened to Russian LNG. So they, lots of you know bits and pieces from around the market, uh, an evolving one. Who, gentlemen, do you think will be the winners or losers? Uh, starting with uh, David. Oh, oh. <laughs> it's me first again, Steve. That's not fair. It depends well, how you depends how you define <laughs> a winner. You're the closest. Loser. You're the closest to me, David, because you're in Oxford. Oh, Oxford. I see. Oh, I, on my screen, I'm third down. Actually, Patrick, <laughs> between you and me. But anyway, uh, it depends what, how you define a winner and a loser. Okay, uh, if it's if it's uh, uh, if it's getting security of. A supply. I actually think Europe is a winner because winner. Uh, if you you've got to be able to guarantee getting that gas. Uh, effectively, it's price that's going to pull the cargoes in, uh, and Europe has the flexibility to offer that price because in the end, the consumer has shown that. By the way, as uh, Graham said, the, the, the consumer has been able to uh, uh, pay the pay the price, which politicians haven't wanted to be able to get that higher energy cost. So a winner. Uh, in securing uh, energy uh, is great. The loser is also Europe because they're having to pay more for their energy. So I, I, I think it, it, it's a winner and a loser. It, it, it depends. I could have thrown it back to you to say, Steve, to say, you know, what do you mean by that? But uh, you're, 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 you're the moderator. We can't ask you questions. No, uh, you can't <laughs> ask now me. fire it to Graham or Patrick. I think, I think you know, one, one of the big winners of, of the situation we've had over the past 18 months has been uh, liquefaction project developers. Yeah. If you look, if if we went back to the end of 2021 or slightly earlier, many of those projects that have now either gone ahead or have, have strong momentum were probably dead in the waters, a bit too strong. But, you know, yeah. really their, their prospects look pretty grim. A lot of the funding taps were being turned off in, in the US for new uh, liquefaction development. So, you know, the, the, the boom in demand from Europe has given all of these projects a, a, a massive uh, shot in the arm. And so I, I, I think they're probably one of the biggest winners yeah. of, of this whole situation. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Graham. Uh, Patrick, do you want to come in on this or? Yeah, actually, I mean, uh, well, I, I agree with uh, what I was saying, and uh, I was going to, uh, to to say that uh, Qatar and uh, US developers were probably the, the big winners, and yes, yeah, exactly for the reason mentioned by, by Graham, it, it, they are now in a position where they will find buyers willing to commit on the long term that would allow them to underpin that project or so to finance their project, uh, and and this is something that is that what well, that is critical for them. So yeah, definitely, those are the winners because well. I think well, that, that has always been this long term contract trend, and we've seen that even in the US before 2021. But it, it's given a push, uh, and and so it's it's clearly uh, something that is making the the market conditions very favorable for these project developers. Uh, and on the loser side, yeah, I mean, I, I, I subscribe to what David said. I mean, in terms of pricing, yeah, I mean, yeah, we, the, Europe has been able to to balance itself in between supply and demand, but at what price? So yeah. yeah, you're winning on one side. So you you you, you make sure that uh, people could get their gas to to for their heating, that the industry can keep on running, and so on. But the price of that has been tremendous. So uh, well, hopefully Europe will remain on the winner's side, but at a lower cost uh, in, in the future. Indeed. All right. Well, I, can say, I can interject with one point. You know, if, the other winners, of course, are the are the floating storage and regas unit holders who had spare capacity. Uh, if you were sitting on an FSRU when uh, Germany decided they wanted to, and Italy decided, and so did the other, some of the other countries, Finland, for example, you know, you did pretty well out of it, okay, because your, your vessel was able to be positioned at high risk. And also those people who were sitting on long contracts of LNG, but they hadn't hedged them. I think they were the ones who were also the winners. Okay, thank you. Uh, and also also the, the, the holders of uh, both US liquefaction capacity or offtake, and um, European regas capacity. Mm, you know, yeah, in, in 2020 and 21, you had people paying to get out of these positions because they were underwater. Yeah. If they'd held on to them until last year, they would have, you know, recouped their losses 10, 20, 30 times over. Yeah, and paid for the whole contract for the next next few years as well, Graham. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like if I'd known who was going to ring the or win the derby, I would have backed that horse. Um, so let's. <laughs> Let's go to the third poll, gents, uh, between uh, between us all. Um, and the question uh, being asked this time is, 
which contract lengths will LNG buyers target in the next two to three years? Which contract lengths will LNG buyers target in the next two to three years? There it is on your screen now. Um, very straightforward, uh, A, B, and C. A long term, which is five years or more. Uh, short term, less than five years. And spot, uh, less than three years. So a very three months. Strong, th three months. Sorry, three months. Thank you, David. Um, yeah, very straightforward question. Um, slightly technical. Um, but um, so important, uh, so important. Which contract lengths will LNG buyers target in the next two to three years? Uh, A, long-term, five or more years. Short-term, less than five years. Uh, spot, less than three months. Uh, and we'll try and get the um, uh, poll results up as soon as we can. Um, after that, I'm going to take a, a question from uh the audience because it's, it's good to hear uh from the audience and the, the question by the way will uh concern uh china uh, china and then europe but let's uh find out the results of this first okay still waiting for it to come in uh, so bear with me gentlemen i want to try and uh, move on to these um audience questions as soon as we can as we move into the third quarter of this uh hold on yeah uh long term uh five or year five or more years a uh, simple 67 percent then 33 and then 17 overwhelming uh quite clearly overwhelming uh graham do you want to kick off a uh, simple um <laughs> with uh, sort of due deference to our hosts, it's it's not a question I would have asked because no, I don't think you can you, you can't generalize. I, I've okay. given you an example of you know somebody we've worked with in Europe that if you'd asked this question a year ago, they would have looked, their answer would have been A. Now their answer would be C. But then if you're talking about a buyer in 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 China with you know different drivers, no liberalized gas market, alternative sources, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, that answer may well be A. So, you know, uh, I don't think you can generalize on this question. Uh, how long's a piece of string? Is yeah. that what you mean? Yeah, okay. Um, uh, David and uh, Patrick, your reaction? Yeah, m m well, well, first of all, due deference to the organizers, uh, long term, uh, I wouldn't have said five or more years, I would have gone 10 to 15 years. That would have really done a differentiation here. I think it also depends uh, on, the, on the regions of the world. If you, if you were to say Asian LNG buyers, I would have gone for A long term. If you were to go for European, it would be a B or a C question. So I think it's 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 a definitional thing of the type of buyers and also the actual length of contracts. Okay, uh, Patrick? Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to repeat uh, everything I would say. So yeah, I completely agree with that. Uh, and uh, even though my preference is personally for long term because uh, I I'm more working on long term contracts and I'm just uh, lobbying for myself. But uh, yeah, that's uh, clearly uh, to me very different from the region. So yeah, I agree with what you said. Okay. Um, right. I want to put a question from the audience. We, we've talked about China on several occasions, but this question has come in, the first question. Uh, in your opinion, what does China's reopening and economic revival, um, which halted a little, certainly sort of uh, during COVID and after COVID, mean for the country's LNG demand going forward? And will that ultimately pull gas away from Europe? Who'd like to start on that one? Okay. Well, I think to be honest, that harks back to a story that we're already telling towards yeah. the end of last year that, oh, Europe was lucky in 2022 because Chinese demand was reduced because of COVID restrictions. It's going to be much more challenging in 2023 as Chinese demand roars back, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I think the, the near term economic outlook has been a little bit hazier than that. And so, you know, demand, I don't believe, has, has come back maybe anything like to the extent that was was expected however you know longer term i think the position uh, from a demand outlook is is still pretty positive as i uh, described previously we still see a lot of infrastructure uh, developments on the, on the chinese import terminal side 
and I think uh, you know we can we can fully expect that upward trend on on Chinese LNG imports to uh, to reappear before long. Okay. Uh, uh, thank I, think you. I pick up the second part of the question. I think the question saying is, will we be short of a uh, will LNG be pulled away from Europe into China? As I said in my introductory, uh, of, uh, sorry, responding to the first question, in the next couple of years, it's, it's pretty tight. But when, when we see the uh, US LNG starting up uh, in the large volumes, you know, we are going to be in surplus globally. And so uh, I think that China will be able to absorb more LNG in the kind of 26, 27 beyond. Uh, and it's not going to have an impact really uh, on LNG availability elsewhere in the world. Uh, after that, after 2030, 2035, it really depends on policies uh, on energy transition and the role of LNG and gas, indeed, is in the energy mix uh, globally. Okay, and, and Patrick? Yeah, no, that's, uh, I mean, nothing to really to, to add to that. I would just uh, say that, yeah, uh, we've seen that Europe has been able to, to, to get the LNG uh, when needed. So, uh, and, and, but of course, at the cost. So, if I would say a similar situation arises and there is a need for LNG, Europe would be paying uh, for, for the energy to be coming to Europe. So I, I don't think that uh, we would be a facing shortage or anything like that uh, in, in the coming years. And as David said, from 2025 onwards, I mean, the, the picture looks, uh, uh, well, much more loose uh, in terms of uh, uh, the market. So yeah, very positive. Okay, uh, the second question from the audience. Uh, European natural gas prices recently dropped to their lowest level. Uh, since the start of the energy crisis, uh, what are the implications? I think we've pretty much covered that, unless anybody would like to add to their previous answer. Um, if not, I'm going to go straight back to Patrick uh, and ask, due to the, the EU's climate goals uh, and view of LNG as a transition fuel, Europe hasn't made a lot of progress in locking in long-term contracts for LNG as an alternative to Russian pipeline supply. Does that mean the region may be exposed again to the expensive spot market next winter? W what is your outlook for Europe's LNG imports and supply contracts? Briefly, if you will. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think I think we've, we've, we've covered most of, of this, this question and uh, by just saying that, yes, of course, there is a, there is this exposure uh, because, uh, well, there hasn't been uh, this, uh, this potential new new wave of uh, long term contract signed by uh, uh, European utilities or European buyers. So, yes, in the coming years of this winter, yes, there is still a, a potential risk. Well, risk is it's a price risk. Uh, okay. It's not going right. to be a, a, a supply risk at the end. Um, and um, uh, David, uh, just one extra question. I won't put that question to you because I think you've answered, or we've answered it. Uh, but security of supply, this is something you've reiterated your views on this. And I know how important it is, and we all do. Security of supply has become more important to certain countries, but not yeah. to others. Will that impact on the costs of project implementation, uh, depending on location? Uh, I, uh, good question. I think that uh, it certainly security of supply is, is more important. Some countries, well, I, I mentioned the Baltics. Uh, the the it, I think there's a, on a cost issue. I'll just raise one other thing. I think with all this demand for infrastructure, you know, if you want, for example, floating storage or regas unit, you know, if you want an FSRU today, you know, you won't get one before. 228, 229 because of the rebuild, and it's going to be more expensive. So I think there's no doubt about it. When you, you're you trying to pull in infrastructure uh, and it's short and we've got labor issues, as you know, there has to be an impact on cost. I don't think it's going to be very large, but there will most definitely be a cost implication. Okay, thank you, David. Uh, Graham, any last words before we, we wrap up? Um, not, <laughs> no, not really, frankly, Stephen. I think we've uh, we've covered everything off nicely. Thank you. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm very happy. Uh, anybody else want to interject for just to sort of uh, as I conclude this? Well, listen, I think we've we've covered just about every aspect uh, of this subject. Uh, I want to thank you um, for attending this webinar series supported by the Alatia Foundation in partnership with Refinitiv and LSEG Business. Um, please don't forget to fill out the post event survey on the same event page. But for now, from me, Stephen Cole and all the team behind the webinar, uh, and from today's expert panelists, and they were experts, so I thank them very much for their contributions, uh, David, Graham, and Patrick. From me, Stephen Cole, it's goodbye.